Hello, my name is Charles Brunier and I'm a, a performing songwriter from Maine. As a songwriter, a lot of what I do is tell stories. A lot of times I try to make people laugh or make people think about things. Today, we're not going to do it with music, but I've got something incredibly important I want people to hear about and think about and maybe make a difference with this very serious subject that we're dealing with in Maine right now, and that's the boycotting of Maine's lobsters. What happened was the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, in an effort to try to get people to uh, help save the North Atlantic right whale from going extinct, um, decided to red list lobsters and encourage people to boycott the eating of lobsters. Whole Foods stopped selling lobsters for this same mission. And I'm sure many other things have, have as well. The Lobstermen Association, or I think several of uh, several groups of lobstermen have filed suit against the Monterey Bay Aquarium <clears throat> because what they're doing is is totally the science doesn't back it up. It's just plain unfounded. So having a history of lobstering, I mean, my dad was a lobsterman. I lobstered before high school and all through high school and a few years after that. And I had, uh, when I got out of the business, I had, you know, a full-size boat, hydraulic hauler, you know, almost 300 traps. Um, I was serious, seriously into it until we had a bad season where there wasn't much happening for lobsters and I couldn't pay my bills. And I decided it was time to get out of the business, which broke my heart because I loved it. I love lobsters. I'd do it now if I could make sense of it. It's a, a beautiful way to make a living. It's not an easy way. It's not a... Uh, it, it can be a dangerous way, and it can be extremely expensive. We'll get into that in a minute. But I wanted to do something to draw attention to this and see if I could help in some small way to get the word out as to what these fishermen are dealing with. If you come to Maine right now to visit, you will see uh, bumper stickers and T-shirts and things that say, you know, help save the Maine fishermen, Maine lobstermen. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering what that's all about. Well, I'm going to try to explain what it's about. It's about this boycott. And I want, I want to show people why it, why it can't be that the main lobster men are, are, damaged, are doing harm to the North Atlantic right whale. And uh, the uh, efforts that are being taken to save all whales. that are Because we do have whales in, in Maine's waters. We have quite a few. It's like seven different uh, varieties. I... I've seen a few. I've seen pilot whales. I've seen uh, a finback whale one time. Um, they don't count, but I saw two enormous basking sharks, which was amazing. But uh, I've only seen two whales in all the years of sailing these waters, and I've sailed all the way from New Hampshire to the Isle of Ho, um, and all the years of lobstering. And most lobstermen that I've talked to have never seen a right whale, ever. Um, but we'll get into all that. So I've decided I wanted to do something to help, and it started with a lot of research. I wanted to be sure about what I'm saying and, uh, and learn all that I could, and even talk myself out of it if necessary. Because if, if, if this is the case that I'm wrong, I don't want to do this at all. I would never, you know, want to be accusing something that isn't the case. But I was very convinced of what things were, were that were happening with lobsters, uh, lobstermen, and my research has backed that up. A lot of graphs and charts and things, they tended to back up what I knew the situation was. The only time it didn't were the few cases where they were uh, pro-whale people and they were very vague in their language, that most likely this is happening in Maine and most likely this because it's happening here. I'm sure it's happening, a lot of that sort of stuff. And anyway, one particular article that I read really hit to home. In fact, I almost gave up this whole idea thinking, eh, maybe I'm wrong. It was the Humane Society of America that did a piece about this. And they were talking about the Gulf, of Maine, uh, about uh, Cape Cod and, uh, and the Gulf of Maine. And the fact that the, that the, uh, they're showing examples of, of, you know, whales that got into gear around Cape Cod. I guess it's quite a problem out there. Well, the first thing that I thought was, uh, is it all from lobster traps? Because there's tons of other things out there that could be causing problems like that. Long lining, which have two buoys on either end. 
gill nets, which not only have buoys on either end, but have a clear monofilament net stretched out to catch fish in it. Uh, tons of things dragging, seining, all sorts of different things are happening. Offshore lobstering, by the way. The Maine lobstermen are predominantly fishing along the coast. The big offshore lobster companies, I guess most of them aren't even from Maine, they, like New Hampshire or something, a lot of them are from. Um, it's another whole world that they're dealing with. And maybe they've got problems, I don't know. But the fishermen along the coast of Maine, in the Gulf of Maine, I don't believe are the problems. And, and here's, here's one of the main reasons why. They were saying in this article from the Humane Society of America that the North Atlantic right whale travels from Cape Cod past Nova Scotia to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. That's where it, it does its feeding. They don't come into the Gulf of Maine waters at all, especially since the uh, global warming has warmed up the Gulf of Maine. They claim our waters have warmed more than anywhere else on, in the, on the planet, which is depressing, but when it comes to the right whales, they don't, they're not interested in coming into our, our, our Gulf of Maine. Now the Gulf of Maine is enormous. It is from Cape Cod, all the way around to Nova Scotia. So it, it involves Maine, Canada, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. It's got this huge coastline, but then it also has a couple of uh, uh, shoals where they fish on uh, George's Banks and Jeffrey's further out, which is more in line from the going up the coast from uh, Cape Cod up to Nova Scotia. It's like a little to the left as, they, as they're traveling through, I believe, if I have my... I, if my memory serves me well. But that's all way out to sea. That's not where lobstering j tends to happen. Guys go out in the winter to deeper waters, but not that deep. I mean, my dad went to fish. I fished with him for in the winter. And, uh, you know, we'd go several miles out to sea, but we didn't go out to George's Banks to lobster. So, so that's what we're dealing with. We can't be killing whales our main lobstermen can't be killing whales if, if the North Atlantic right whales aren't even coming into our waters. And I am firmly convinced that that's why I haven't seen one. And any of the fishermen, I know tons of fishermen. I've, I've fished out of Cannonball Port. I've fished out of uh, Deer Cundy's Harbor with my, my five trap license. I lived in Islesboro where I knew many lobstermen. In fact, Dan, my friend, is from Islesboro, who's given me most of my information about what I'm talking about. Um, none of them, nobody's ever seen right whales. So I've, you know, that probably explains why. Now, some people will say, oh, because you haven't seen them doesn't mean they aren't out there. And maybe there, maybe there have been some at some times out there, but it sounds like they haven't been in our waters in quite some time and it doesn't look like they're going to be coming anytime soon. So, but if they did come into our waters, let's, let's take this approach. Suppose a a North Atlantic right whale decided he he wanted to come in and he wanted to get himself into some of our gear. Well, what are we doing to keep the whales safe? The state, with all this lobbying of pressure of, uh, to try to save the whales, has enforced quite a few laws that the fishermen have to abide by. And the first thing that they're doing is requiring that the lobstermen mark their, their trap warp or rope uh, with purple. The way I did it was I painted it. That's what this is right here, with spray paint. Um, I've heard some guys, you know, they, they brush it on, whatever, but it's a time-consuming, messy sort of process. you got to hang it up to dry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that everybody's been doing willingly, but it's kind of a pain in the neck, and it doesn't last. At the end of a year of fishing, hauling by hand, the stuff was wearing out, and growth was on it and everything, and I'd have to repaint it every year. Now, with five traps, that's not the biggest thing to ask somebody to do. But with 800 traps, that's a lot just to be able to mark your gear. And the reason they're marking the gear is so that if any gear, any main gear gets caught up in a right whale, they can identify that it's from Maine because it has purple. Now, the other way they can do it, in addition to painting it, is to change to purple trap warp, which they also have as they sell. Um, then they never have to paint it. It's always it's purple all, all the time. But... You're talking two hundred dollars a coil, and they've got to they get like a dozen traps or less if they're in deep water, so it's a lot of money to outfit all you to get rid of all your trap warp and go with purple. Um, in addition to that, there's a new thing. There's always new things that they're coming up with. Um, one of the new things that they're doing concerning trap warp 
is they don't want float rope anymore. Float rope, that's what this is. This is poly. It floats. They have what they call float rope. They have what they call sink rope, which is normal trap warp, which I don't have an example of handy. But it's just rope that sinks in the water. They've decided they didn't want anything floating up off the bottom. Now, when I fished back in the 70s, we used bobbers. In fact, years ago, uh, our bobbers were a styrofoam. They're like a buoy, but they're smaller, a little square sort of styrofoam chunk that would, um, well, they're round, but squared off. So they're not pointed like a buoy. Uh, kind of like a donut sort of a thing. And they, they would you tie those onto your line and they would help hold the rope up off the bottom of the, the ocean. The reason we do that, I did that, was because uh, there's a lot down there that they can get sn uh, snagged on. It's, it's not just beach under there, it's rocks all over. Maine's coast is very rocky, and it's not just rocky where you see it, it's rocky all underneath the water as well. And so that's how you try to keep your stuff from getting snagged up and losing traps, getting hung down and stuff like that. It's a constant battle. It, they're always losing gear, and, and it's, it's, you know, with storms and things, the traps take a beating, the traps, you know, it's it's not easy. But one thing that has always helped was being able to keep your lines up off the bottom. And float rope replaced bobbers. Guys could put this stuff on, and it would just float up. When you have a gang of traps, what they call trawls of traps, some, uh, my dad used to fish doubles, I fished single traps. Uh, my friend John uh, fished four, uh, gangs of four. Uh, I understand now they're pushing guys to have 10, 20 traps uh, to a trawls in some areas to reduce the amount of buoys that are out there to help keep the whales safer. And that's, these things that are being done, I'm sure are contributing to why the statistics show less and less damage to any whales at all. Uh, it's down to almost nothing. When you consider thousands and thousands of, of lobster traps all up and down our coast, there's very, very little damage happening from these. Uh, almost nothing. And nothing concerning right whales that I know of at all. So, so anyway, now they, they've changed it. They want all of the rope that's at the bottom to lay on the bottom. Nothing can be lifting up. So no more float rope, no more bobbers. The line has to lay down in the rocks. Well, that means all the problems we always tried to solve by having things lifted up. When your line's laying down there, getting blown, you know, moved around with the, with the ocean's action and everything, it's just a nightmare. I, I can't imagine how much gear is getting lost especially with some of the other things that they're being asked to do. In addition to having a, well, let's go on to the buoys. In addition to having the, the, the line, the trap warp marked purple, they also want the buoys to have a quick release so that if anything tugs on it with 600 pounds of pressure, it'll break free. So the way to do that is, is maybe more, but I know of two ways. One is to use hog rings. A hog ring is a little stainless steel wire like that. That is crimped around. It's used to put nets on traps, to make the doors have hinges. It's it's a useful thing in building lobster traps, and it's useful to make these rope these knotless loops. And the purpose of this is with 600 pounds. I had to buy shackles also, so I could take my my buoys off to paint them, so that with 600 pounds of pressure, these wire these rings would bend open, and now we have no knots, just a, a, a loose piece of rope that'll just pass through, and the whale can't get snagged on it. So that's one way. If you don't want to, like I say, I'm with five traps, so hog ringing seven of these on, you know, isn't the end of the world. If you've got 800 traps, you know, you may look at things differently. There's another way that they can do it, and that involves these quick releases for buoys. They swivel, and they have a little thin spot. If you look in the, the end here, see how there's that little area? That area breaks away with 600 pounds of pressure. Neat but they also have to hook them up. They have to take the labor of attaching these to the buoys, to the, to the trap warp, and they have to pay for them. They cost $7.29 last they heard. So once again, more expense, more labor. It's kind of a, a theme for lobstermen. It's just, they pile on more and more and more, and now they want their lobsters to be worth less and less. That's why it's so, so awful. Anyway, that's one way, to, another way to do those. But what happened was, in addition to doing the buoys, and when I did my five trap license, all I had to do was the purple, and I had to set up the buoys so they could come off with 600 pounds. And I thought, you know, even though I'm in 20 feet of water where a whale couldn't get if he wanted to, okay, sure, we'll do that. 
what the heck, you know? Law is a law. It's a good cause. You know, I understand. These guys have all done this stuff willingly. They, they all complain about everything, but nonetheless, you know, it, it's got to be done. It's what they do. So they do all this stuff. Now they come up with a new thing. According to my friend Dan, they were asked to, or told to, I guess they don't tend to ask things, that they require them to have uh, not free lines. So what they did was, um, I didn't talk about the, I didn't get to the midpoint breakaways. Let me get that in a minute. Uh, actually, let me talk about that now. Then we'll talk about the, uh, the not free lines. In addition to the buoys breaking free, they came up with a new idea. Oh, no, this is part of it. I was on the right track. He spent thousands of hours splicing all of his lines so that they didn't have any knots. Now, this is what a splice looks like. So instead of having a knot to make this loop, it's spliced together. It's just a little fatter in that area. Well, if you're splicing two ropes together, it's the same idea as if as a loop, only it's just two lines coming together. So he did that to all of his knots so that they would have no knots, so that any rope that slid through the fin of a whale or something would have nothing but a splice to slide on through. He did all that work. And then the state came up with a new thing because they tend to do that. And the new thing was they wanted midpoint breakaways. Halfway between the trap and the buoy, they wanted another thing that would break away. And this one, they required uh, 1,500 pounds of pressure, I was told. But then uh, one of the devices I have here is 1,700 pounds. Pretty much, pretty close to the same thing. Uh, one way to do it was with what they call whale warp. Whale warp is a very thin lobster trap war. This is not whale warp. This is a piece of nylon, but it's the right size. And I'm not spending $200 just to show you what whale warp looks like. Basically, we get this sort of warp, which by the way, when I, I want to make this clear to my fishermen friends, because I can just hear them say it, what kind of, what kind of guy is using float rope at the buoy? Okay. I get all this rope for free. It's real good rope. And I put weights on mine, uh, net weights, to hold it down so my rope wasn't floating just want to make that clear because i just i could feel that one coming anyway so they, they would take these now all of these lines that he's made splices in now he's got to cut them in half and tie knots to put these things in which make a weak link i think i was starting to show you three and seven inch for normal trap warp five sixteenths for whale rope the whale warp that would break easily with 1,500 pounds of pressure. Now, one of the downsides of that, when we're talking, I just mentioned earlier, some guys 10, 20 traps to a trawl, they part that one, it's one buoy going to all those. And if one's hung down and they're trying to free it and that thing breaks off, now they've lost all those traps, $200 a trap, not to mention all of the trap warp that's involved. Maybe they can sag with a grappling hook. It'd be a lot easier if the rope's floating up or they, something they could hook. No, it's that everything's working against them. And these things, by the way, according to my friend Dan, when they go through his hull, they shake his boat like crazy. And his hull, it chews the, the small uh, warp up. So he has to constantly replace this stuff, hopefully in time, before it parts off and he loses gear. So that's one way that they did the midpoints. Another way that they do it are with these little plastic, like a donut sort of thing. I've got donuts on the mind today. <laughs> anyway, these things, with 1,700 pounds of pressure, will also break apart. And you got to attach them somewhere. You got to tie, splice, something to hook these things in. Or what they're doing, one of the suppliers I, I, I found, uh, they make these things up ahead of time, splices in the end, and that breakaway in the middle, so they can buy these and tie them into their line. More expense. Someone's making these things up. Someone else has to buy them, tie them in the line, more knots, more things to go through the hauler to protect whales that aren't even here. It just doesn't make sense. But they're doing it, willingly. They may complain, but they're not necessarily gonna break the fishermen with these. It's just more expense like everything else in their life. It's when they take into value the lobsters that it really poses a threat to, to harm to the industry. In doing my research, um, I, also found one thing that was doing serious harm to whales. Not just whales, porpoises, sunfish, sea turtles, all sorts of things. And that's ships running into them. There, I heard that, uh, one of the things I read, that there's like a thousand 
whales are killed a year from ship strikes, and I doubt if all of them are reported. Can't imagine how many actually are dying, because I'm sure a lot of them uh, didn't need to be told about. So there's a real concern. And the shipping industry, they're working on trying to make things better with them also. They're trying to get them to control, uh, to go at slower speeds, to uh, avoid certain areas at certain times, especially when the whales are migrating and stuff. They're trying to make that better. And I sympathize with them because like the loftsmen, uh, they're providing a valuable service and trying to make a living at it. And it's, it's just difficult. And everyone's trying to do what they can to help the whales without breaking an industry. You wouldn't boycott the shipping industry. Can you imagine how much all of us would suffer? Could we physically survive boycotting the shipping industry? No, I don't think we could. It, it, it would be unthinkable. I doubt if anyone will ever recommend it because it's too important. Too many people would suffer. All of us would suffer. But you can talk about boycotting the lobster industry because I guess they figure just the lobstermen suffer. But not just the lobstermen. Their families suffer. Uh, people in the business that uh, sell lobsters, that truck lobsters, you know, grocery stores, people that sell lobster uh, fishing supplies. All sorts of people are affected by this. And not just in Maine. Canada, even their crab industry is, get, is getting the same flack with the whale stuff with their buoys. And this is like up, uh, uh, I think, further up from Prince Edward Island, that area. They're having a major problem with the same kind of nonsense over the crab uh, buoys, uh, over the right whales. Uh, but then you get New Hampshire, Massachusetts, say lobster, not just in Maine. So a lot of damage is being done by all this. Um, so like I say, if they could put the same thinking that they would put to not boycotting the shipping industry to the lobster industry, you know, we'd be a lot better off. So the boycott has been really doing a number on things. And one of the things that it's doing is drastically affecting the price of lobsters. Um, it's hurt the fishermen so much. Uh, there was a, one story that Dan was telling me of. One of the guys went out with $1,000 worth of lobster bait. $200 worth of fuel and caught $1,000 worth of lobsters. Another friend of his uh, mentioned that his crew went without getting pay for quite a while because he, he couldn't afford to pay him. And fortunately, they get back on their feet and it all worked out. But people can't survive that forever. You know, eventually, they're going to bail. And what I hear, a lot of fishermen have already given up. Dan had to take on side jobs and sell some of his uh, possessions just to try to keep himself afloat one year. One of the last years, it was last year that happened. It's not looking any better. Uh, there's a chance that he may have to give up. A lot of people, are his son, who wants to become a lobsterman someday, is talking about the, maybe that's not going to be there for him. It's that scary. I know uh, families that have been in the, I mean, I, I followed after my dad, but I mean, it's, that's a, a, a big tradition in families. I live in a fishing community now where there's a lot of family uh, of fishermen. I have a friend, uh, a, a lady fisherman, actually, who's somewhat famous in the state for her racing lobster boat, uh, uh, Gold Digger. Who Her father was a lobsterman out of Harrington. Uh, her husband has his own boat. She has her own boat. Both of her boys have their own boats, and every one of them are incredible boats. Very valuable lobster boats. They're worried. They, they may not be able to keep lobstering themselves. Maybe she won't. She's talking about maybe not racing anymore because it's just everything is so expensive. It's it's doing them in. It's getting that kind of serious. Um, so I was trying to find out what sort of price um, the lobstermen get because it gets to the point where they're not worth much. Like uh, my friend Butch, uh, when I was back in my Kennebunk Port days, was telling me one time that he liked it when the lobsters weren't running because he didn't have a whole bunch of lobsters to keep alive that weren't worth anything. Um, at the time I looked into it, and if you look into it right now, I'm sure it changes constantly. You'd probably say, well, that's not what it is. Well, it was when I looked into it. The price they were talking about was $35 at a low price that they were selling lobsters for, and they upwards to like $1,000 with shipping around the world and everything, which totally propound, which totally blows my mind. But the only thing I can come away from that with even if these numbers aren't right, they're not giving these lobsters away. Lobsters are worth a great deal 
in the market for them to sell. Meanwhile, at the same time they're, pay, they're selling for those prices, the lobstermen are getting $3.50 a pound. And sometimes the dealers weren't taking the lobsters because they couldn't move them. If people aren't eating lobsters, if restaurants aren't ordering lobsters, if they can't ship them overseas because there's no demand anymore, whatever, they're worthless. And when they're worthless, these guys can't make a living. There were stories of some of these lobstermen selling their lobsters on, on um, Facebook, just trying to unload them because the dealers weren't taking them sometimes. And taking them for very little money isn't helping their case at all. Their price dropped, I think it was around, if I have my years right, I think it was like 21 to 22 in that region. One year, the price of lobsters dropped in half from this boycott stuff. Half. That means unless they're going to go catch twice as many lobsters, their income is cut in half. And meanwhile, we've got traps that shoot up three times their value to $200 a trap. We get all these different things. Everything just getting, like everything else in life, more and more and more expensive. Diesel fuel is $6 a gallon. More and more and more. And they use tons of diesel fuel, by the way, just to push these boats through the water. And everything that they do is in a hurry. The boats have to have pushed hard because it's a race. They get up there with the crack of dawn when the sea's fairly calm, and it's a race to get all they can haul and get back in as the day gets progressively choppy and, and harder to work in. And it's like an Olympic event. They haul these traps up. They, you know, they get the bait out, get the lobsters out, get the new bait in, get the traps lined up as fast as they can, drop them off back in, and then push the boat hard to get as fast as they can. It's like a race to get to the next traps so that at the end of the day, they've got something to show for it. And the more their lobsters aren't worth anything, the more lobsters they have to catch to try to make ends meet, the harder their work is. I watch guys go out where I live, I can see boats going out to sea. I watch them go out in the morning at the break of dawn. I watch them coming home at night as it's getting dark. I don't know if it's the same boats that whole time, but these guys are putting in some time, just trying to make ends meet. So that's what we're dealing with with the price of lobsters. Um, I had another point I wanted to say, and it just slipped my mind. Oh, I know what it was. This, <laughs> of all of the things that these guys are made to do, and it's not funny, I shouldn't laugh, but it's, it's just ridiculous enough to be. Um, they're working on a new plan. The people who are pro lobster, that I've watched some videos and stuff, some of them are very set on trying to stop lobstering completely. Now, if that happened, we'll talk about that in a minute. That can be catastrophic to the lobstermen as well as the lobsters. We'll get into that in a second. But one of the things that they're, they've come up with that they think might be the answer is uh, buoyless traps. Traps that, there's two ways I've heard that they can do it. One is to have the, uh, the lobster buoys held down with some kind of time release device that would release the buoy to pop up in time for them to haul it, if everything works right. And another way is to have a bag that blows up with air. I'm guessing with like a CO2 cartridge or something that blows the bags up, and then the trap itself floats up to the surface. Well, now the first thought I'm thinking is we're gonna have traps floating around instead of buoys at the surface. We're gonna have to have quick release devices in case the whales get into the traps. I mean, there's one problem right there. Then there's the problem of all of these things working in an environment where marine growth happens all over the traps to the point where they have to boil traps trying to kill the growth on them because things just get covered with, you know, various sea growth and grass and things, seaweed and things that grow on stuff and barnacles and stuff. It's, it's an ongoing battle just to try to keep ahead of all that. Even the, even the, the trap warp gets covered with slime and stuff. It's just it, things grow on stuff and they make it more difficult to work with. So now we're going to have devices that have some kind of way to let these things go with all this, this marine growth to deal with, with all of the, uh, the rough life that a, a trap has with getting banged up and wedged into rocks and all these different things. These devices are still going to work. And, and what are they going to cost? You know, and even if they were free, we're going to ask these fishermen to take time, add time to what they do to try to desperately get these things baited emptied out and back in the water. Now they've got to stop and arm them with some kind of a, you know, 
device that'll rot off in a few days or re recoil the rope and set the buoy in or have some kind of CO2 thing. They got to set these things up, even if it were given to them. And it won't be, I guarantee that. Even if it were free, the amount of time that it would take away from them being able to haul means they can't haul as many traps. They can't catch as many lobsters. It's one more thing to weight them down. And these people can only take so much before they're going to give up. So, so anyway, if, if they manage to stop the lobster industry completely, say the whale people have their way, then there's no more lobstering. Like there's no more Maine shrimp being harvested. There's other things that we've lost along the way. So let's say they put the Maine lobster industry right out of business. Well, first of all, we're going to have a lot of people looking for work who are trained to be lobstermen. What are they going to do for work? Are they going to find work? They've got families to feed. They've got, you know, they've got lives to live. How are they going to function? Now, we have other industries also that are affected. People that take care of boats, people that sell boats, people that build boats, people that uh, work on moorings, people that work on lobster gear. All these people, people that sell bait, all are going to be affected by this. Not just the lobstermen. It's going to be catastrophic all over the place. So that's the first thing. But what's going to happen to the lobsters? We're worried about taking care of the whales. Well, that's a noble thing. They're big, beautiful whales. We can see those. But we have all these other living creatures that we don't see. So I guess we won't know. But I'll tell you right now what's going to happen to them. They're not used to eating fish. Fish is something that get brought to them by the lobstermen. They eat herring, they eat redfish, they eat pogies. Lord knows what else. Mackerel, whatever anybody will throw in there for them. They get fish in their diet. Otherwise, they don't grab a fish with a claw and eat it. That's not natural to them. They'll eat a dead fish. They'll eat things off the bottom, dig stuff up, and eat whatever they can you know, scavenge on the bottom. They'll dig up clams and crush them. But the clams are not very plentiful anymore. So when all of this food goes away, and when we stop catching lobsters, so now their numbers quadruple overnight, they're all going to need something to eat. And one of their main sources of food is going to be gone. What's going to happen to them? I say we consider saving the, the lobsters. And ironically, the way to save the lobsters is to eat lobsters. Because when we can keep this industry strong, the lobstermen take care of the lobsters. I said in the very beginning that I'm a songwriter. I forget to plug my songs. I've got a new song about this very subject. It's called Set the Lobsterman Free. I'm going to record that fairly soon. That'll be available along with this. It tells this whole story in three minutes, basically, three or four minutes. But it doesn't get into the details, obviously. Uh, and I also have another song that's already out there in YouTube and Facebook under Charles Bernier. And it's called Lower Than a Lobster. It's sort of a kid sort of a song about what the lobstermen do to take care of lobsters. And they do a great deal. The lobsters are very plentiful because of the state's requirements and what these fishermen do to take care of their, their world. First thing they do, the lobster measure. This is a lobster measure. They hook it in the eye socket of the, it sounds painful, but it really is, and it's a show. This goes around the eye. They don't hit the eye itself. They catch the back of that, measure to the back of the back, and if it's too small, they can't keep the lobster. Meanwhile, small lobsters are able to f eat for free and travel right out of an escape vent that's in the traps. They don't even have to be thrown back. They can walk right out of the trap. All their life, until they're big enough to be caught, they're fed for free. We also have, on the other side of the measure, we have uh, uh, another measure that measures if it's too big of a lobster because they can't catch a lobster that's too big. It has to be just the right size. So if a lobster lives long enough to be too big for the rest of his life, he eats for free. If it's a female lobster and that lobster has eggs, which they also call berries, they're like, they look like little, little beads of berries inside of the tail. It's like stuck in the tail. Uh, if you catch a lobster with eggs, you have to throw her back and you have to notch her tail they put a small notch in so that other lobstermen will know that that lobster is a breeder and not allowed to be caught for the rest of her life eats for free for the rest of her life so these fishermen are not just feeding the lobsters that they're going to catch they're feeding lobsters they'll never catch they're feeding crabs they're feeding fish all sorts of things uh, enjoy this bait that they pay dearly for and send down when that's all gone tons of things are going to suffer it's going to change everything be catastrophic down under the water. 
Maybe we will see it. Maybe we'll see dead wa lobsters washing ashore or something, and we'll see signs of what's going on. I don't know. It, it's going to be ugly all over. This will be the most horrible thing the state's ever seen as far as, uh, you know, a business failure, industry failure. It would be catastrophic. Our government has been trying to fight this. She's managed to get more time because they've been trying to put these uh, buoyless, buoyless trap measures in place and stuff. They want everything immediately. They got their issue and they're pushing it. And she's like, let's give these guys some time. Let's, let's take a few years. So she's bought us a few years to try to get these answers figured out what we're going to do next. In addition to all the things they're already doing for whales that aren't even coming into our waters. So that's my talk. Um, I hope it makes some sense to people. And I hope when you, when you go out to dinner, if someone suggests uh, not eating lobsters because it's hurting uh, the whales, like my friend told me, a lifelong Mainer I know, who said, I understand the whales are being killed by the boys. I'm like, no, no, that's not true. Uh, you're just being, you bought the, the story. It's not, that's not the case. If, if, if this could go viral, if, if people could spread the word and get people to understand why it's, I would say, impossible for Maine to be hurting North Atlantic right whales. Um, and then also to know what they go through, how hard their life is, how much their expenses are, all the measures they're taking to help, and how serious this is affecting our business, and how many people are already suffering, already out of work. Um, maybe it'll make a difference and maybe people will eat more lobsters because that's how you can help the lobstermen is to eat, eat more lobsters. You'll help the lobstermen, you'll help the lobsters. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. Let's hope this industry can survive.